you know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on SportsGrid. The sharpest football contest show in the land. The Las Vegas Football Contest Show focuses on Circus Sports Million, Circus Survivor, and the Westgate Super Contest, handicapping the games and releasing our contest picks every week of the season. With two former Super Contest winners, Brady Cannon and James Salinas, a former NFL player, Mike Pritchard, and over $1 million in contest prize money won combined, the Las Vegas Football Contest Show will have you prepared this season like none other. There is going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. We're going to go through every single thing, and I've got a great team behind me that's going to help me get the job done. I want this to be the place that people come to. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. There is not going to be a better place, I promise you, than game time decisions. We will have everything at our disposal, and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. Talk about your freshman year at Alabama and even the redshirt year that got you ready to perform at the highest level. You had to learn a lot about humility, about being patient to play at Alabama. And you still knew that you are going to have a shot to win a championship every year. And so that that's the line. And so I think, like, that's what's really missing with today's football. you got NIL, you got social media. The Early Line, only on SportsGrid. Some more scores from Sunday as we start our number two live right here on the early line on Sports Grid. It's a new week here on TEL. He is Donnie Wright's side. I am Ben mm-hmm. Stevens. Some more scores from week two of our NFL Sunday slate. We'll look at Monday Night Football tonight in Philadelphia, where Kirk Cousins will play week two in primetime against the Eagles in Philly for a third straight year, despite now being on Atlanta that's an interesting quirk to tonight's game for Kirk and then of course we'll recap what we saw in week number three of the 2024 college football season DRS let's continue to dive right in it was a Mm -hmm. spot that if you just follow betting lines and you look at things it felt like the Packers were the right side as the underdog despite Malik Willis who signed with Green Bay about three weeks ago making his fourth career start in his first since his rookie season that was disastrous in Tennessee. And sure enough, it was correct. Green Bay wins outright as a field goal underdog in the home opener in Lambeau with Malik Willis against Indianapolis. 16-10, to the Packers outright. Willis throws his first career touchdown pass in his NFL career. 12-14, of 14, 122 yards and a touchdown. As efficient as you can want. Green Bay runs for 261 yards on 53 attempts as a team. Such dominance on the ground that Jair Alexander said he was kicking back on the sideline. That's the Packers defensive back with his feet up. And it will be the shortest film the defensive staff ever has to watch. Green Bay wins outright as a home underdog against Anthony Richardson and Indianapolis. Standing ovation for Matt LaFleur. That's what a head coach is supposed to do. Put your quarterback in the right position. You might say, like, Donovan, what are you talking about? You just said the Steelers. You didn't like the way Justin Fields played because he didn't have to do too much. Understandably, in three or four weeks, you might get Russell Wilson back. Not the same thing as getting Jordan Love back. Your only goal for the Packers after losing opening night was tread water. Hang out around 500 here till Jordan Love comes back. You'll make the playoffs, and you can do some damage at that point. I was so impressed because the handicaps coming in before the game were correct. You can only go on what you've seen before. Malik Willis is a bad NFL quarterback and hasn't really rose to the challenge. Now you're getting a pretty good Indianapolis Colts team in town that you say, okay, if you give me Jonathan Taylor 12 carries for 103, oh, they probably won that game going away because Anthony Richardson made some plays. But still, 50% passing, 17 of 34, one touchdown, 
three interceptions. This It's a yeah. lot of what we saw at Florida coming to roost here because you wanted the guy to say, okay, let's really get you in the pocket. You want to make plays with your feet, I get it, but just make the simple throws. He's not doing that. Like, you want to put on a master score. And I love Shane Steichen. I think he's a very, very good and talented head coach and offensive right. coordinator. But yesterday, LaFleur, who every quarterback, a co- excuse me, coach, wants their quarterback to throw a little over the yard because that's what they do. 12 of 14, a buck 22, passer rating of 126, run it like crazy. Yes. Josh Jacobs took great down in Brazil. Now he goes for 151. I love that performance. They only scored 16 points, but they won a football game that many people, including myself, probably thought they weren't going to win. Love what LaFleur did in Green Bay. Yeah, total stays under 38 and a half as well. We thought that Anthony Richardson would take a couple of learning lumps. This is his de facto rookie season. You see the talent at times, but there are the questions in terms of development at this level. 17 of 34 for more than 200, but that touchdown pass and a lot of the yardage came on the final drive under two minutes that made it a one-score game, albeit his last interception came on that Hail Mary attempt, but still three INTs yesterday against Green Bay. The Seahawks win in overtime in New England. They were a three-point favorite. That pushes the Patriots at least 1-0-1 against the spread. Far more competitive DRS than we maybe expected under Gerard Mayo. How about Kyler Murray and Marvin Harrison Jr. yesterday? They absolutely hammer the Rams 41-10. Matthew Stafford behind a banged-up offensive line. Sacked five times. Cooper Cup exit early with an injury. That's not good. Already missing Puka Nakua. But Kyler Murray and Marvin Harrison Jr. Four connections yesterday for 132, 130 yards and two touchdowns. This followed a week in his NFL debut that MHJ had one grab for four yards. His first two catches yesterday were both for touchdowns he is here and Kyler looks good maybe the most impressive game under Jonathan Gannon out in the desert the first time Arizona booked as a favorite under Jonathan Gannon and they make really good on that number winning by 31 last year Ben I was off on two football teams I thought the Saints would have a really good year and win double digits and I was wrong on that and I thought the Rams would be selling their entire football team by week number seven they turned out to have a decent season this year I think that, you know, the Saints might be that 10-win team I was hoping for, but also the Rams, they might be selling everybody. You take a look at Puka Nakua. He's talking about not coming back maybe until week number nine. You saw Cooper Cup like, oh, let's see how he holds up. He's been injured a lot. He's injured again. And quite frankly, I watched the majority of this football game. The Arizona Cardinals, Ben, they could have scored 82 points in this game if they wanted yeah. to. The Rams didn't want to be there. They didn't want to tackle. They didn't want to defend. They didn't want to play offense. They didn't want to block for Matthew Stafford. And quite frankly, I needed a Kyron Williams touchdown, which somehow by the miracle, I got that as a rushing <laughs> yeah. touchdown in the second half when they were getting obliterated. Never expected that. But that 41-10 to 10 was the worst. At least say 31 points. Like, oh, that's really bad. This could have been so, so much worse, which again, at least yeah. are the Cardinals maybe not as bad as we thought they were to enter the season. Maybe they can win seven, eight games. But number two the Rams look absolutely dead and buried and that stuff for your head coach to go back and watch this film it's like did everybody yeah. quit on me four incompletions from Kyler Murray 266 yards three touchdown tosses they also ran it yeah. for 231 yards Murray had 59 <laughs> James Conner into the end zone 21 carries for a buck 22 it was really good for Arizona it was really bad for the Rams it continues to be bad in Carolina they get absolutely hammered by the Chargers Jim Harbaugh and the Bolts off to a 2-0 and start both straight up and against the spread they've told you what they're going to do Greg Roman the offensive coordinator they are going to run it J.K. Dobbins at least 130 yards in each of the opening two games for LA the first Chargers player since LaDainian Tomlinson nearly two decades mm. ago to have consecutive games of 130 yards at least on the ground the Chargers win easily covering as a four and a half point road favorite in Charlotte 26 to 3. And by the way, we had a segment yesterday. Who's your favorite touchdown score of the day? By far for me, it was J.K. Dobbins. He punched one. And even at the FanDuel yeah. Sportsbook, they were off in the 50% boost on any touchdown score yesterday. I used that on Dobbins. 17 for 131, a touchdown. Almost a carbon copy from what we saw in week number one. But this is what you love. He is bringing Michigan football out to the West Coast. Yeah, They're 2-0 yes. now and just absolutely being physically dominating over the first two games. Now, granted, you might say the competition level might not be that high, but we just saw the Raiders go on the road and beat the Ravens. 
Ravens here. And now you're seeing the Panthers, who we don't expect much out of. But when you know you have a football team that can't score, that's got to be Jim Harbaugh's favorite type of game. He goes, you know what? We're going to run it. And he could he reach yep. this year, Ben? a game where he runs the ball 50 times. He almost sure. got there yesterday, which is insane. For, yeah, absolutely. And look at Justin Herbert's stats from yesterday. 14 of 20. Was injured in the opening mm -hmm. half. He will be reevaluated throughout the week. He did end up playing the entirety of the game. 20 pass attempts in week two. 26 in week number one against the Raiders. I'm looking at it right now, DRS. 20 I believe, is the career low for Justin Herbert, mm. at least in a completed game. It is the first time in his NFL career he has had less than 30 passing attempts in back-to-back -back games. It is a completely different script now for L.A. Meanwhile, Bryce Young, 84 yards. <laughs> 84 yards yesterday for Carolina. DRS, it is the 11th time in the last 12 games, dating back to the end of his rookie year, that Bryce Young has thrown for less than 200 yards. The 11th time in the last 12 games. I, I don't, there, there cannot be a change made with the number one overall pick from 2023 at the quarterback spot. There's no point in doing that for this porous Panthers team. But it could be a disaster by the end of his second year that Bryce Young might not see year three. And again, you're looking at the Panthers who figured they got their franchise guy and would be bad. Well, they traded a pick away last year. Now they're going to get, let's just say, the number one overall pick. Are you going quarterback again, number one overall? I, I mean, David Tepper, what have you done to this franchise? I don't know. And Dave Canales might be that sacrificial lamb <laughs> once again. From Sunday to Saturday, college football recaps next. going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. We're going to go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's going to help me get the job done. I want this to be the place that people come to. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. There is not going to be a better place, I promise you, than game time decisions. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into game time decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on Sports Grid. The only streaming sports betting network. Tips, info, and insights to up your IQ. It's smarter to be on SportsGrid. New to the Live Golf Plus app. Watch Live Golf any way you want it. Follow any group. Replay any shot. Anytime, anywhere. Any questions? Watch Live Golf live and on demand. He had four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. A football weekend in review, not just a Sunday slate around the National Football League, but the entirety of Saturday in week number three of this college football campaign. We have a new number one in the AP Top 25. It's the burnt orange of Texas, flip-flopping with Georgia, who was number one entering the weekend, but now falls by a spot down to two. Did Georgia lose in a road SEC opener? Mm. No. 
They won 13 to 12. They just came nowhere close to covering as a 21 and a half point favorite against Kentucky, a Kentucky team that in its SEC debut two weeks ago in Lexington lost outright as a nine and a half point home favorite against South Carolina. The Gamecocks continue to cover as an underdog this year. It was not pretty. DRS for UGA by any means, but they still win. They still remain unbeaten. I am not overly concerned about Georgia. We saw Kirby Smart lose his mind multiple times in the final five minutes of the fourth quarter, much like his boss and former mentor in Nick Saban. That's a scary thing for Georgia and maybe for the rest of college football. I still think UGA is going to be locked in. Yeah, they're going to be fine, but these are some of the games that sometimes as a coach, you can finally get the you know, ear, let's just say, of the team in these meetings. Hey, you guys want to coast along pretty soon like your dreams are going to go up in flames. you got to really lock in. They did get the victory. They were sensational on defense, but that's not really the focal point here, right? You look at Carson back, 15 of 24, buck 60, no touchdowns, no interceptions, QBR rating 69. Now, say what you want. Hey, it's on the road against the SEC. Uh, you know, I didn't turn the football over, but we're way past that for Carson back. Like, we're talking about a quarterback that's supposed to light it up here and came back for absolute dominance on offense and we didn't get that in the Kentucky game and you're right it wasn't as if you were going on the road against hey it's always tough to play at LSU or Alabama and you just don't want to have those mistakes here this is Kentucky and they're not a very good football team to me this year at least based on SEC standards we didn't get any of those explosive plays we can count on the defense they did win the football game I'll give them credit for that yeah. but they didn't look good doing that and, and the defense had to come up with some big stops yeah. and turnovers yeah. just to keep this game right for the Georgia Bulldogs 15 consecutive wins for Georgia over Kentucky. The Cats' last win over the Dogs back in 2009. But Kentucky does cover as a 22 or 21 and a half point underdog. There are some issues with this Georgia football program, of course, off the field and on the roads. Daniel Harris, a sophomore cornerback for Georgia, arrested late last week for reckless driving charges. Of course, I'm sure you have seen all of the driving and traffic incidents in Athens. Something seems a little bit off with UGA, but as for the actual football performance, they're still 3-0, plus 210 to win the SEC, still the favorites, but they do fall back in the national championship market. Ohio State, now the favorite. Georgia's second best price, Texas third best number in the sense between the Longhorns and the Bulldogs, not nearly as drastic. Texas now the number one team in the country. 56-7, to seven, an easy victory over in-state foe UTSA on Saturday night in Austin. Texas covers as a 35-and-a-half point favorite. Texas now 3-0 and against the number. One of two teams in the country that have covered in three games this year against FBS competition, Arizona State, the only other. And it wasn't Quinn Ewers who was injured in the opening half. An abdominal strain is what they're calling it. He's considered week to week. We'll see what that means. Texas has Louisiana Monroe this upcoming Saturday. What it does mean, at least for right now, and what it meant on Saturday night, Arch Manning. And oh boy, 9-12 for 223 yards, four passing scores, 53 yards on the ground, including a rushing touchdown where he was clocked at over 20 miles per hour breaking down the field for a touchdown. The speed, much like his grandfather, Archie, and not his uncles, Peyton nor Eli. (laughs) Yeah, how did that, you know, the the, the mojo? Because I believe his father was a wide receiver, so maybe he got the quicker genes out of it here because he looked yeah. tremendous in that game. Now, here's the question I have for you, Ben. Quinn Ewers did yeah, get please. injured, but it doesn't look like it's going to be long-term. Nobody's going to rush him back next week against UL Monroe. But what happens if Arch goes out there? 9 of 12 again, 223, another yeah. four touchdown passes, looks good on the ground. Like, I understand that, and most coaches are right with this. When you're a good football team and your quarterback is very good, he shouldn't lose his job just based on the play of the backup quarterback for two weeks while he's out, as long as that quarterback is playing well. But we've seen it in time, and it's those changes have been made. Is there any time that you believe, if Arch plays well again, against an underwhelming opponent again next week, should he be in that conversation? Or if Quinn uh, Ewers struggles in like the first half yeah. of their first – football game come sec play i I don't think so i have often maintained drs from the start of 2023 here into 2024 that if arch manning is playing ahead of quinn ewers for anything outside of injury that's a bad sign for the longhorns arch has been great 
And Archer's looked really good in the two appearances we have seen out of Manning this year against Colorado State and, of course, on Saturday night against UTSA. We'll see what the injury severity is. Mike Quinn Ewers even be back for week number five at home against Mississippi State, Texas's first game in SEC play. A Bulldogs team that lost at home by a lot to Toledo. I'm not entirely sure. The weekend after that, though, the Red River rivalry against Oklahoma. Quinn Ewers is the starting quarterback in Austin. I think Arch Manning gives you a lot of hope for the future. Just my estimation of where things are right now. Again, when you look at the national title odds, Texas third best price at plus 550. The Buckeyes, the favorites at plus 330, plus 370, the number on Georgia. Arch Manning now, though, Just from the Heisman Trophy perspective, Quinn Ewers entered the weekend as the short favorite at 5-1. He's now 22-1. His backup, Arch Manning, is 25-1, only $3 behind. Yeah, it's great. You're going to get that hype because of speculation if he takes over now, which is still early enough in the season. Nobody separates himself. Texas goes on to win the SEC championship and then obviously moves on into the college football playoff. He's going to be getting a lot of those votes. And certainly, if you're going to put up that many points, which means four touchdown passes and an extra rushing, you're going to get that attention. But also, let's not leave out Quinn Ewers. It is about a team game here. And usually, the best player on the best team here is going to get the most votes. We're just trying to figure out right now who might be the best player on the best team. But I got to tell you this. Arch Manning has been a great teammate because not once have you heard over the past couple of years, Ben, nope. that he is so right. upset he's not starting and feels slighted. There is something to be said about that. That's a great teammate. Yeah, he really is. We'll hit on a couple of other notes from a college football Saturday. We'll continue it into our second half hour, and Donnie will get his time to slander Florida State next. Oh. going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. We're going to go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's going to help me get the job done. I want this to be the place that people come to. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. There is not going to be a better place, I promise you, than game time decisions. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into game time decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on SportsGrid. The only streaming sports betting network. Tips, info, and insights to up your IQ. It's smarter to be on SportsGrid. New to the Live Golf Plus app. Watch Live Golf any way you want it. Follow any group. Replay any shot. Anytime, anywhere. Any questions? Watch Live Golf live and on demand. And four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. A wild game in Columbia, South Carolina early on Saturday between LSU and the Gamecocks. The Bayou Bengals do win 36-33. South Carolina covers as a a 6.5 point underdog. If you wanted turnovers and sloppy play in the final few minutes of what was a crucial game 
You got it. I mean, it was insane. LSU does prevail, winning that game outright to start off SEC play in year number three under Brian Kelly with a victory. But South Carolina, a really good defensive team, despite LSU scoring 36, should have had more. Nick Eman Wari picked off Garrett Nussmeyer in the fourth quarter, was taking it back uncontested by mm -hmm. himself for a pick six. And Kyle Kennard, who had a pretty good game in the first three quarters for the Gamecocks, got called for a completely unnecessary, unsportsmanlike conduct penalty that brought it all the way back. South Carolina then had to punt after a three and out. It led to LSU's game-winning drive. Yeah, it was a crazy game all the way through. And for me, I had a uh, money line parlay that one of the legs was LSU just to win the football game. Forget about the spread. <laughs> yeah. Early in that game, I thought he was writing it off. And they're like, ooh, LSU's coming back. And every time I kept checking the score line, it's like, wait a second. South Carolina just got the football back. How'd they score? 66-yard run, 75-yard yeah. touchdown run. Like, LSU yeah. wasn't even in it and still was able to win that football game, which was so impressive. South Carolina should have won that football going away, and they lose that For at sure. home. And you're right. That was one of those where you just scratch your head and either team you figure is going to win it at this moment, then they're losing. Then a late field goal at the end of the game. LSU score. It's crazy, crazy to watch. But 36-33, you'll take that if you're Brian Kelly and the Tigers. But that's a missed opportunity for South Carolina. Yeah. They should be 3-0 and in the season and 2-0 and in conference play. And now they dropped the 1-1 and on the game. They just blew it home. They are 2-0 and against the spread as an underdog in SEC play to start. But Donnie is spot on. Post-game press conference tables were quaking in fear, thinking of LSU coughing up this football game. And that Brian Kelly post-game presser, they remain safe. Elsewhere in Columbia, Missouri, the only top 25 tilt we had on Saturday, the sixth-ranked Tigers, the 24th-ranked Boston College Eagles. BC led 14-3 early in the opening yeah. half. Missouri does win 27-21. The Eagles do cover as north of a two-touchdown underdog. Missouri's defense, good on the ground, only allowing 49 yards to a BC offense that had put up north of 250 in their first two games. We can talk about Alabama up in Camp Randall against the Badgers. Tough break for the Badgers, mm. opening offensive drive. They had a little bit of life. Tyler Van Dyke scrambling to pick up a first down on the right sideline. Goes down with a non-contact knee injury. Had to be carted off. It looks like it is Braden Locke's team. But in terms of Heisman consideration, Jalen Milrow, only 196 yards. But again, just on 17 attempts, threw three touchdowns, ran for 75 yards, and two more scores. Donnie, three consecutive games to start this year for Alabama. At least two passing touchdowns for Milrow, along with two rushing scores in all three games for the Crimson Tide. The Tide rolls in Madison 42 to 10, easily covering as a 15 and a half point favorite. Yeah, you had a boost for that game. So I said, let me cook up a little bit of a parlay. And maybe I went a little bit light. I'm like, oh, I think Milrow can throw one and run for one. Should have went for two and two because he got three and two in this football game. That's a pretty impressive performance. But you're right. A lot of air out of the bag there for Wisconsin who came in the game two and oh. They were still 16, 16 and a half point favorites at the gun before the game started. But it was a wrap once Tyler Van Dyke went down in that game. And it was an easy cruising victory. Interesting. I love to see this, though. Alabama going yeah. to Wisconsin, something that we don't really see SEC teams going up north. I love like it. that much better than just wrap outing some whack opponent at home that you had. So like to see they stretch their wings and big winning yeah. easily. That's going to go a long way. Good win for the tie. And listen, Luke Fickle's got a lot of questions to answer in year two. You can't lose that marquee spot, despite what the odds makers say. Your team more than a two touchdown home underdog in yep. one of the great environments of college football. But it's tough to truly evaluate when the starting quarterback, Tyler Van Dyke, gets injured on the opening offensive possession. I promise you will have some time on the other side of the break, but let's just start with this. Florida. Go ahead. What is I'll that? Oh, is that, the, is that the music. war chant? Go ahead. Yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll yeah, do yeah. the war chant in the background. Go ahead. Go keep talking. Yeah. But like, do it, but do it kind of quiet because the war chant no, has been no, anything no. but this year for Florida State. They're 0 2 inside Doak Campbell, they're 0 3 overall. As the Memphis Tigers go on the road to Tallahassee and went outright 20 to 12 as an outright six and a half point underdog. DJ Uyongalele, 16 of 30, 201 yards, an interception. FSU runs for 37 yards as a team on 24 carries. Mm. And for the second time in the last four oh. years, Florida State under Mike Norvell starts 0 and 3. Donnie right side's time next.
is going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. I want this to be the place that people come to. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than game time decisions. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. The only streaming sports betting network. Tips, info, and insights to up your IQ. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. New to the Live Golf Plus app. Watch Live Golf any way you want it. Follow any group. Replay any shot. Anytime, anywhere. Any questions? Watch Live Golf Live and On Demand. He had four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. All right, I teed it up. Another Florida State yeah, flop good. on Saturday at home. Memphis wins outright 20 to 12 as a six and a half point underdog. For the second time in the last four seasons, FSU has started 0 and 3. Donnie, right side, the time is yours. Now, look, we could all sit up here and say Donnie was right. And yes, you would be saying I was right at this point. I don't even like the here's the funny part about it, Ben, is I feel like I'm going to be able to get to do this every single Monday we come on the air and we can laugh at Florida State. But you saw, and you know, the cracks in the foundation. Always love to use that, that tagline. But there are that. When Florida State hired Mike Norvell, you thought you were getting an offensive guru from Memphis. Didn't start out all that well. Jordan Travis was a wonderful quarterback, and they did play some good mm-hmm. football. But the vibes for me started to go against Mike Norvell was late last season. Yes, they won an ACC championship here. But let's take you through what happened after that, right? And you could say they were wrong. It was. I wish the 12-team playoff was in last year. I would have no problems, Ben, getting Florida State in that top 12 to say, you know what? You earned your right into it. You won the ACC automatic bid. Even though we know you're going to get smashed, round number one you still deserve that play play for that championship but the fact we only had four teams get in everybody knew outside of Tallahassee that Florida State absolutely stunk as a football team without their starting quarterback it was apparent they weren't going to do anything in the college football playoff but here's a chance that you have to make it right with your university and show that team leadership here you saw it with Georgia they got beat in the SEC championship game did Kirby Smart say I hate this the rules are so unfair I can't get this football team hey everybody you can leave <laughs> campus don't ever come back no they showed up in the orange Bowl and they smashed the hell out of Florida State sending the college football playoff like you should have kept us in we would have won a championship but we are a good football team with a strong foundation watch us go into next year now we're going to make it right florida state gave up and got hammered one of the worst bowl beatings you're ever going to see and never recovered because you can't sell your locker room back what was mike norvell actually telling that football team Ben, before the season those first three games it's okay to quit on your university you got wrong the world is it's an unsafe place out there you better get out into it now because we can't win any more games here it's embarrassing what happened now here's my favorite part they open up 0-3, which I think is hilarious. They went out and got DJ Uyunglele, who flat out can't play, and they don't even have a backup right. quarterback because the Rodemakers of the world said, you know what, this is a losing team. I'm even getting out of here at this point. But hear me out on this. Mike Norvell is owed $65 million. He's the biggest winner. 
Florida State's not going to be able to pay him out. So whether or not they go, I don't know, two and nine or how many games, two and ten the rest of the way here, he's still going to be your football coach at this point. You made your bed. You got to lay into it. One of the more embarrassing institutions over the past six months, it's Florida State. Yep. There is absolutely zero culture in that locker room, and it starts with their head coach, who's a straight-up loser. So when you look at the Orange Bowl, right, opt-outs for a lot mm -hmm. of the guys that were leaving for the National Football League cannot blame them for not playing in that game. I think it says a lot of the roster turnover challenges that Florida State had to play. But I also do believe it can be representative of that culture and identity. I did not think it would carry over. It has. And FSU has been stagnant on f offensively, whether that's because of mentality or lack of talent or Jordan Travis was the greatest ever college football quarterback we have ever <laughs> seen. Florida State is the worst total <laughs> offense in the ACC, the only one averaging less than 340, and they're putting up 274. They are the only or second rushing offense in the ACC, only Duke, who has 98 yards per game on the ground. Florida State averaging just 52. They are the only scoring offense in the ACC, averaging less than 26 points per game, and it's 15.3. And that's the ACC, not even the AP Top 10, where Florida State was ranked entering this season. And it doesn't get easier. The Knowles, a two-and-a-half point home favorite on Saturday night against 3-0 and Cal who already went on the road to the plains of yeah. Auburn in Jordan Hare and knocked off the Tigers. Again, this could be a disaster when all is said and done. Just some other Saturday scores as we fly through. Florida loses at home to Texas A&M. The Aggies 33-20. to Whether it was Graham Mertz or DJ Lagway, they combined for three INTs. A&M easily covers as a two-and-a-half point road favorite in the swamp the second time the gators is under a field goal underdog at home have not even been close in a game they were expected to keep tight billy napier's job very much up in the air at this moment miami's the only good team in the sunshine state ucf did win against tcu on saturday night in a wild scoring game but florida not great florida state awful miami Darn good. Now 3-0, 62-zip over Ball State. Cam Ward, the Heisman Trophy favorite, throwing for nearly 350 and five tuds. Jackson Dart, though, the nation's leading passer. They beat Wake Forest so bad, Wake decided to cancel the second leg of the home-and-home. Home. Next year, up in Oxford against the running Rebs, Ole Miss easily covering as a 30-and-a-half point favorite, winning 42-6. Oregon takes care of business in the rivalry matchup against Oregon State. The only cover this year for the Ducks. They cover as a 17-and-a-half point favorite. No Cam Rising on Saturday for Utah. Zach's younger brother, Isaac Wilson, throws three touchdowns in a much higher scoring game than I was hoping for in Logan mm. against the Aggies. Oklahoma wins. Michigan survives. Oh, boy, Davis Warren is bad. And the Wolverines yeah. are a six-and-a-half point home <laughs> underdog on Saturday in Ann Arbor inside the big house against USC. Yeah, by the way, Notre Dame putting up 66. You don't mind the actual blowout Oof. where they're still throwing the football late in that game. You got to get the good mojo back, and they really got that yeah, against Purdue. But how about the tail, Ben, of two MAC teams on the road in SEC competition this Saturday? Tennessee scored 37 points at the end of the first quarter and 28 oh at the end of the break. They won, so they could have oh won. God. That could have been that Cumberland football score from like back in like the, the 1800s, no it was like 366 to nothing at that point. But also, yeah. if you didn't see. Stark Vegas lit up on Saturday night. The lit way up. Toledo lit that town up 41 to 17. Toledo moves to 3 0. And I say this because the Mac went on the road and knocked off a Notre Dame team that beat Purdue by damn near 60 points in that game. That is an awesome showing for the Mac. So the only thing I hope now is. Hey, major conferences, don't just say we can't now play the MAC. we got to actually go to the MEAC here as opposed to the MAC to play. I love sure. what I'm seeing out of the MAC. Those teams are fighting and winning big games on the road outside of Kent State. Okay. Yeah, listen, Kent State's bad. By the way, Kent State plays Penn State this week. Just pay attention to that. Oh, no. My girlfriend, Chloe, oh. a proud Golden Flash alum. She's heartbroken. Yeah by the nature of her football program yeah. there in Kent, Ohio. They lost to St. Francis two weeks ago. St. Francis <laughs> in Pennsylvania, their first ever win as an FCS program over an FBS foe. And yeah, they got beat 71-zip by Tennessee 
55 and a half was the Volunteers team total. They nearly went over that in My the opening goodness. half. But to your point, DRS, we love Mac. We love the Mac, right? Because of Mac and because of what it means to us come November, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights. But there's a really real possibility. That wasn't well phrased. But there's a real possibility that the Mac, as we are looking for that group of five conference champion that will be in the Ooh. hunt for one of those five automatic berths to a college football playoff. We thought it might be a team out of the Sun Belt or Memphis out of the AAC or Liberty from Conference USA, Boise State in the Mountain West, and they all are going to be in the running. But there's only one ranked group of five program right now, and it's Northern Illinois. And you have Toledo whooping on Mississippi State in Stark Vegas. By the way, Jeff Levy. Not up to a great start for the Bulldogs. <laughs> they lost to Arizona State last week in Tempe. ASU's first ever win against an SEC school. And then, of course, they get hammered at home by Toledo. The Rockets were booming on Saturday in Starkville. Absolutely, they were. And also, take a look at Mississippi State. Now, here's how you know you're bad. Florida's coming to town favored by about four or five points already. So you're going to get beat. Like, Billy Napier is going to get a life raft because he's going on the road in SEC play to get a cupcake team like Mississippi State. All those times are tough. It was just a couple years ago, Ben. Weren't we enjoying, like, say what you want. Mississippi State was never going to factor in probably to the national championship picture. But, boy, oh, boy, they had the pirate down there coaching. And at least times were fun in Stark Vegas. What a stark contrast now. Things just look like they're off the rails down there for the Bulldogs. If Florida loses that game... They're going to lane Kiffin, Billy Napier. He's not getting back on the plane, flying back to Gainesville. More on the early line next. There's going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. We're going to go through every single thing, and I've got a great team behind me that's going to help me get the job done. I want this to be the place that people come to. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. There is not going to be a better place, I promise you, than game time decisions. We will have everything at our disposal, and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on SportsGrid. The only streaming sports betting network. Tips, info, and insights to up your IQ. It's smarter to be on SportsGrid. New to the Live Golf Plus app. Watch Live Golf any way you want it. Follow any group. Replay any shot. Anytime, anywhere. Any questions? Watch Live Golf live and on demand. Again, four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Listen, we're about two weeks away from the end of this 2024 Major League Baseball regular season. So a very quick update from the weekend that was around the majors before we dive into the end of week two of this NFL regular season. Monday night football in Donnie's neck of the woods there in Philadelphia. Mm. But we start with the other Philadelphia team. That's the Phils taking the final two games of the set against the New York Mets. They win the weekend. JT Realmuto walking it off for the Phils in the home half 
of the ninth. So, because the Mets have lost two consecutive games, they no longer have a lead over the Braves for that third and final National League wildcard spot. The two teams are tied. Atlanta has won two of three so far against the Dodgers. Fourth game of the series in this extended weekend set on a Monday. So, Donnie, not much has changed from where we were prior to the weekend. The Padres sweep the Giants. The D-backs, albeit losing a weekend set, to the Brewers. Those are still the top two teams in the NL wildcard race. Milwaukee very comfortable in the National League Central. The Dodgers still comfortable in the NL West. The Phils have opened up a two-game lead for that NL number one overall seed. The biggest race here down the stretch in these final two weeks, is it going to be Atlanta? Is it going to be New York for that third and final NL wildcard spot? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to watch it play out, too, because the Mets should have had a much better series against the Philadelphia Phillies. I mean, yeah, Cal Stevenson robbing a home run and getting a two-out, two-run RBI to lift the Phillies up on Saturday. And then you have guys like Buddy Kennedy getting base hits here to tie games up in the bottom of the eighth for the Philadelphia Phillies. So some unheralded prospects here that the Phillies are winning with, but also the Mets and the Braves now tied up down the stretch with about two weeks left to go. This is going to be fun to watch because it looks like sometimes the Mets get hot and take that one or two-game lead. Then the Braves get hot here, but it's seems like whoever the Phillies feel like dispatching of lately, they're making major changes to that wild card race. I don't think too many things change here in the National League, but also, Ben, when you're flipping it over to the American League, we thought that was a wrap, basically, on the teams that were getting in there as opposed to the National League, right? We're still maybe up for grabs with a team or two. Some teams are getting dangerously close to blowing that lead in the AL. So there's a lot of fun action to watch over the final two weeks with the expanded wild card and a lot of teams still fighting for positions that maybe, Ben, a week ago, we didn't even think they'd be in it. Absolutely so, DRS. Just quickly here to tidy up the race between the Mets and the Phils. New York starts a home set today against Washington. It's really their last easy Mm -hmm. schedule or at last easy set on paper. Then they have a four-game set this weekend against Philadelphia. We'll see what the Phils still have at stake. And then a week from tomorrow in Atlanta, second-to-last regular season series, it's the Mets and the Braves for three in the ATL. Now, to the American League, as the RS was highlighting, the Yankees take the weekend against the Boston yeah. Red Sox, winning three of four in that rivalry set. They now have a three-game lead in the American League, uh, American League East over the O's, who have dropped seven of their last ten. But from the wild-card perspective, Things are getting a little dicey at the bottom. The Twins trail the Royals by two and a half games, that second and third spot. Minnesota, two and a half games up over Seattle. And another American League Central team, that would be Detroit, who just won the weekend against Baltimore. Detroit only two and a half back incredible it is because we thought it was the Orioles and or the Yankees in that top spot here the Kansas City Royals had always playing decent baseball and somebody in that like AL Central was going to clean up there with the Minnesota Twins but now you're seeing the Tigers coming on strong and also the Mariners we thought this was one of those just remove the Mariners from the race because the only way they can get in and or the Houston Astros for months it was like they had to win their division can you imagine the AL West getting two teams in the playoff race one division champion and one team just behind them losing out and quite frankly the Mariners have the pitching to do some damage look it's always been about the bats for them if they can just average three to four runs a game they should be in it but I never thought they would be only two and a half games out and certainly the Detroit Tigers seem like coming out of nowhere here and also we're not talking about great pedigree teams like the Twins and the Royals oh they're always in it they're always dominating we'll see if one of those teams slips up because you take a look at Kansas City seven and three in their last ten you'll take that but the Twins four and six in their last ten games which is coupled by the Tigers and the Mariners both seven and three in their last 10, you're going to get a lot of cold feet heading down the stretch. I wonder, if I ask you now, Ben, right, Orioles, yeah. Royals, and Twins, one of those three teams to me is not going to be in the wild card. How about that? I think one of the Tigers think, and or Mariners, I think, catches one of those teams. I think it's Minnesota DRS when you look at it. Minnesota yeah. 71 and 56 on August 21st. From that point, they're 8 and 14. That's bad baseball. They've lost 13 of their last 20 games. We go to August 22nd, where Detroit was four games below 562 and 66. The Tigers are 15 and 7 from that point with a series weekend win over Baltimore. If it's going to be anybody, it's going to be Minnesota on this slide. Can they hold on for dear life? We have two Mm. weeks left of this MLB regular season. Every team pretty much has played 149, 150 games. We're talking about a a two-and-a-half game difference being 
evaporated with only 12 games left yeah. in this regular season. It's still a lot of ground to make up, but that's why we like the expanded postseason in Major League Baseball. All right, let's start our full breakdown of Monday Night Football. DRS's birds at home tonight, back from Sao Paulo. Yeah. An extended break playing on this Monday are the Eagles hosting the Atlanta Falcons. A battle of the birds tonight where Philly's a five-and-a-half point home favorite. 46 and a half is the total. A little bit of line movement here bright and early on this Monday. Donnie, I mentioned it earlier. A.J. Brown not going to play tonight for Philadelphia. What do you make of the numbers entering the finale of Week 2? Yeah, and exactly. You saw A.J. Brown pop up on that injury report early in the week. Most people don't think twice about it. The minute I see hamstring, you know he's not playing this week. And quite frankly, A.J. Brown probably not playing next week as well. Hamstring injuries are absolutely devastating. Hey, T. Higgins, uh, got a little tight hamstring in game week. He hasn't played for two weeks either. That's just the nature of the beast when you're dealing with a quick yeah. twitch position. Having said that, you saw down in uh, Brazil, both of those defenses, talking about the Packers and the Eagles getting shredded. I told you right away, yeah. you can't take anything from these defenses on tape because it was an ice skating rink. You see how the Packers bounced yeah. back against a pretty good offense in the Indianapolis Colts? They were phenomenal in that football game. I expect the Eagles to have a bounce back performance. And also, you saw even week number one, still a good performance by that Atlanta's defense. I look at that 46, yeah. 46 and a half, or 46 and a half, 47 and a half, and say to myself, A.J. Brown's not there tonight. Maybe more grounded pound. I think Bijan Robinson has a great game. I think Saquon Barkley does. Maybe we are looking yeah. at an under in this game, Ben, when possibly a week and a half ago, maybe you're thinking about more fireworks in this one. We'll continue to break it all down on the other side of the break and what the season outlook is for both of these teams up next on the early line. going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. We're going to go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's going to help me get the job done. I want this to be the place that people come to. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. There is not going to be a better place, I promise you, than game time decisions. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into game time decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on SportsGrid. The only streaming sports betting network. Tips, info, and insights to up your IQ. It's smarter to be on SportsGrid. New to the Live Golf Plus app. Watch Live Golf any way you want it. Follow any group. Replay any shot. Anytime, anywhere. Any questions? Watch Live Golf live and on demand. He had four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Monday night football in Philadelphia to end week number two of this NFL regular season. We'll get to the game in just a moment, but DRS, some big injury news hitting the wire within the last 20 minutes. We mentioned Isaiah Pacheco, who left the game early yesterday against Cincinnati, was seen leaving the stadium in a walking boot and on crutches. NFL Network's Ian Rappaport reporting it is a fractured fibula. 
based on initial tests. More information will be coming to determine the severity, but he is going to miss a significant amount of time. We'll have the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, on the show in hour three. That will certainly be a topic of conversation. And usually you'd say to yourself, Ben, hey, the Chiefs lost their running back. Well, it's not Patrick Mahomes, it's not Kelsey, it's not one of their receivers, they're going to be fine. Now they're down their big offseason acquisition at wide receiver, and now also down Isaiah Pacheco, who is a catalyst for that offense. He is an unbelievably talented runner and also a very good pass catcher. This is going to be something to watch out for, because also you say, oh, he's going to be down maybe, no, no. He's going to be down at least a minimum of four to six weeks, right? Now they're going to do the MRI, as they say, to see if there's any ligament damage. We asked Dr. Chow about that in a bit. But also keep in mind, this isn't an injury. Like sometimes, Ben, where they hurt their, let's just say, broken hand, hurt their shoulder blade. All right, I'm going to stay in cardio shape. What cardio are you doing here with a broken leg? This could be devastating. This could be even worse than even reported where it's like, hey, maybe it's an ankle sprain, high ankle sprain. He'll be down three to four weeks. He'll be back. This is terrible news for the Kansas City Chiefs. Good that they're 2-0, and bad now for the next, what, month and a half at the running back position. Get ready to meet Carson Steele, the long-flowing blonde oh, wow. locks of a former Ball State oh, running back oh. via UCLA last year. Carson Steele, who has a pet crocodile by the name of Crocky J, is going to be that lead yeah. guy. They really liked him following training camp. I think they'll continue to like him in Kansas City. All right, back to Monday Night Football. DRS, before we dive into the props, let's talk season outlook for both of these yeah. teams. Philly wins in Sao Paulo. They see the Cowboys get hammered at home. The Giants are a terrible franchise. The Commanders are going to be competitive, but nothing all that great. The Birds now nearly a $2 favorite to win the NFC East to continue the trend of nearly two decades of no repeat champions, and the Cowboys won it a season ago. 11 and a half to win total for Philadelphia. The Falcons entered this year as a minus 140 divisional odds on favorite to claim the NFC South. They lost badly at home to the Pittsburgh Steelers in week one. Meanwhile, the three-time reigning NFC South champs, the Bucs, a perfect 2-0, impressive victories in both. And the Saints might be the most impressive team through two weeks in the NFL, also 2-0. A lot of changing tides entering this week two matchup. Yes, there is. And also, if you are taking a look at that future, I'm still not out on the Atlanta Falcons at this point. But sometimes, Ben, this is the tough part about the offseason. You sold a bill of goods where the quarterback is ready. He's healthy. He's ready to go. Don't you remember us having this conversation on this morning show saying, you know what? Michael Penix not playing in that final preseason last two games. They're fine. They saw enough. And everybody who credit the beat report is like, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like they need to save Michael Penix so he can't get injured in the preseason because they just might need him for regular season action, which wouldn't jive unless you saw the performance out of Kirk Cousins where the internet sleuths now are watching a change stance and constant shotgun where Kirk Cousins can't take a five-step drop because it's too much pounding on that Achilles here. That is a major issue. And coming into tonight, I want to be on the lookout for that. And also for the rest of the season, if he's working his way back, that's never a good sign for any quarterback in any situation. So there's more question marks for me from Atlanta Falcons side, but from an Eagles perspective, you're not going to get a fight from Washington. You're not going to get a fight from the Giants. You thought after week number one, hey, look, Dallas Cowboys are going to be formidable. And we're not writing off the Dallas Cowboys. That was a really bad performance, which brings to light Jerry Jones' offseason. But again, we knew they had two great football players. Dak Prescott, regular season quarterback, C.D. Lamb at wideout. Who are going to be the rest of the guys that can step up on offense? Through the first two weeks, nobody's been stepping up anywhere, which includes everybody. How could you have Rico Dowdle as your starting uh, excuse me, running back? Oh, no, don't worry. We'll bring back Ezekiel Elliott. Stop the madness here. It's the Eagles division yeah. now to win for them, even after three weeks. And for the Atlanta Falcons, I have a lot more questions than I had even after these first two weeks are going to be over because I don't know if they're healthy enough, to be honest. Plus 280 for the Dirty Birds. We have the Saints as the favorites, yeah. the Bucks less than a 2-1 to one price, and now Atlanta at plus 280. I cannot wait to get into the prop conversation for yeah. this game where they focus one. on that quarterback in Kirk Cousins. Again, it's a weird thing that Kirk now in three consecutive seasons is going to play in Philadelphia in week two in a primetime game. Of course, the previous two years with Minnesota, the Vikings covered last year, but they've lost by at least six in both of those two games. And Kirk was downright awful last week in his Atlanta debut. Is it because of the Achilles? We'll talk about it next. Hour three starts after the break.